Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is John Bond, and I'm accountable for the sales and marketing in Menmont. We at Menmont are extremely excited to be introducing our new platform to Europe. The Menmont Meridia, a multimodal advanced topographer, has been designed and built from the legacy E300's unmatched performance over the past 20 years, but with more high performing applications to extend your patient care with confidence. Menmont Meridia has been the marketplace in North America, Australia, New Zealand for the past year, providing a ground, a proving ground that it can live up to the E300 legacy on performance and reliability before entering into the worldwide launch. Furthermore, we have some early adopters within the EU and UK that have provided great valuable insights. One of those users will be speaking today. Today's webinar is number two in a series of three, introducing our new advanced topographer, the Medmont Meridia. Today's session titled, The Med Medmont Meridia Advanced Topographer, Now with Dry Eye Applications, will be presented by Professor James Wolfson. We are honored at Medmont to have Professor Wolfson sharing his experience and also educating us today. Professor Wolfson, a professor in optometry at Aston University since 2000, formerly was the head of optometry and deputy executive dean for life sciences and is now the associate pro vice chancellor. Prior to his appointment to Aston University, Professor Wilson was a clinical research fellow at the University of Melbourne in Australia. His main research areas are the development and evaluation of ophthalmic instrumentation, contact lenses, interocular lenses, and tear film. He has published more than 265 full peer review papers and presented at numerous international conferences. He is the academic chair of the British Contact Lens, Lens Association. Having been a past president, he uh, was a harmonizer and a subcommittee chair for the Dues II and joint chair of the International Myopia Institute Reports and was, and was a chair of the BCLA Contact Lens Evidence-Based Academic Reports Clear. With no further ado, it's my honor to let Professor Wilson take the reins. Thank you so much, John. Uh, I really appreciate uh, people tending up to uh, listen to this in your various different uh, time zones. So I'm going to be talking about the Medmont Meridia. And as John said, I was one of the fortunate people to get uh, an early device. So I've been using it probably now for about 18 months and it's become very much the mainstay of our dry eye clinics. My history with Medmont goes back um, over 20 years, in fact. Um, so I did uh, some internship work uh, and an early lectureship out in Australia, and I was introduced to some of their innovative technology. So we're talking about before the turn of the century, I was using their electronic test charts and visual field screeners, um, which were way ahead of their time. We're only really catching up uh, in the last five or so years uh, now uh, here in Europe. So uh, again, it's great to be working with this very innovative uh, company on this new technology that I will share with you uh, today. In terms of my disclosures, I work with a whole range of uh, companies to keep me uh, honest. Um, and obviously uh, this presentation is specifically uh, about Medmont's uh, instrumentation. So let me take you back to the original instrumentation that hopefully you may be uh, familiar with. This is the E300 uh, video keratoscopy device. Um, again, it's become a, a go-to in our profession in terms of topography, uh, that small cone approach that allows you to have many more rings and to avoid many of the reflections that you other get wise get uh, disrupting uh, your topography. Medmont weren't happy with that on its own. Of course, it can get really good readings and we can have all of the normal sort of standardized maps that you can get off a, a topographer, but really they wanted to go further than that. And they've always worked with academia um, to ensure that they can push the technology uh, to its absolute limit. And they did some fantastic work in the early 2000s, particularly with um, Michael Collins group across in Australia and Robert Skander's group in uh, Poland and his collaborations with Australia as well, 
looking at whether we could um, get more information. We know that, of course, video keratoscopy is much better than keratometry. We can go out further than that to typical three to four millimeters, right out um, to eight, nine millimeters. But actually, could we understand even further out, right up to the edge, up to the, the limbus in terms of the topography? And what they introduced was scanning uh, software. So essentially, uh, they could stitch together images taken with our patients looking in different angles. And you can see, obviously, the topography map will change when we do that. So in this example, a composite scan of five images, so a central image looking nasally, temporally, superiorly, and inferiorly. But actually, it can do up to uh, eight uh, or nine as well. Could we get more uh, information about the corneal topography? And does that help us as clinicians to get more information that can be useful um, to the fitting of devices such as a contact lens? This is some work that uh, we did in collaboration with Graham Young's group down in the uh, south of England, looking at the difference between keratometry alone from a keratometer a single image from the Medmont device, a composite of five images, so the four different uh, directions of gaze as well as the central direction, or nine images, so again, central, four different positions of gaze, but also the uh, diagonals as well. And the question was, was could we predict the movement of a silicon hydrogel lens in this case better because we have this further information, because of course a soft lens doesn't sit on that central curvature alone, it actually goes into the periphery and onto the limbus. And what we were able to show is those composite images actually were far more predictive then of the movement of a soft lens than the central readings alone. So already it shows us that pushing this technology gives us further information. So that gave us uh, an instrument that could not only measure central keratometry, but also give us further information right out into the periphery, 11, 12 millimeters worth of information. But also people had long realized that by reflecting myers from the surface, the ocular surface, actually we're reflecting them from the tear film. And that can be a problem, of course, if someone has a poor tear film, how that can affect our measurements but also it's a very good way of then looking at the tear film. The tear film is less than a, a tenth of the thickness of a human hair and transparent, so a real challenge to image otherwise. And what's really nice about the Medmont, and again, those tight rings, is we get lots of information on the distortion of that tear film after uh, a blink. So actually, could we get more information about that? So they introduced this tear film surface quality indicator. And hopefully if the technology is working, you can see a video of it there. So we've asked the patient to blink and to hold their eye open. And if you look particularly in the uh, top uh, nasal quadrant here, you'll start to see distortion of those myers. They're no longer that lovely round shape. And so we can see in our images there, we start with a nice smooth pattern but as we move down, we get more and more red appearing, particularly in that region, indicating that the tear film is distorting. And we can use that to generate then this tear film surface quality index, but also in all the different directions uh, as well. So taking data from these many, many points that are being analyzed in each of those areas. So now we have a quantitative rather than qualitative assessment of the tear film and how it's breaking up. And we can even do that in a local level. We did some early work on these algorithms looking at patients with standard devices uh, such as the yeah, compared to Medmont's ability and also things like symptomology. And what we can see is that these techniques, and uh, particularly the tear uh, film surface quality index, is very repeatable, more repeatable uh, than other techniques. Um, and we get some very high scores there. So it shows the utility of this particular measure. The other thing that was really important about this is communication 
with our patients. When we're showing them uh, a video like this and they're seeing their tear film break up, it helps them to really understand what we've been saying to them and to take that message forward. We know a lot of patients struggle to remember things that we've told them in a consultation. Uh, this is a really powerful communication tool. So what did we end up with? Well, we ended up with a device that actually we already had for our topography and has a very long and distinguished history for measuring corneal topography. But now not only was it a topographer, but we had that extended coverage and also we could have tear film quantification. Better than that. This is something we've talked to at Medmont about and they've stood up to that challenge and provided us now with the Meridia. At this stage, I'm going to step back to TFOS Jews 2. Um, I was involved, in fact, I'm on the TFOS executive board and I was the chair of the diagnostic um, subcommittee looking at how we can better standardize our measurements of dry eye. So let's look first at the definition that uh, the TFOS group came up with. They define dry eye as a multifactorial disease. Well, we knew that already. There are lots of things, of course, that can contribute to that disruption of the tear film characterized by a loss of homeostasis of the tear film. This is the first time that sort of concept has been uh, introduced. As I've said, that tear film is very, very thin and finely balanced. So anything that disrupts that fine balance will cause um, um, problems with uh, symptoms, uh, in this case, accompanied by ocular symptoms. In, there was some argument that the definition should stop there, but actually, other things such as allergy or infections can also disrupt the tear film and cause symptoms. So they put in the pathophysiology, which is that tear film instability, hyperosmolarity. So a lot of dry eye is evaporative. We get an increase in the osmolarity from the salt concentration on the ocular surface, the ocular surface um, inflammation that results from that and resulting damage, and the fact that neurosensory abnormalities <coughs> can also contribute to that. Within that, then they defined the subclassification of uh, dry eye. So we've got our presenting patient, they're symptomatic because that's part of the definition. If they're not symptomatic, it's just ocular surface disease. Equally important to understand, particularly if you're going to compromise the cornea by doing surgery or you're going to fit them with contact lenses, but obviously you're not trying to then improve the symptoms. But a patient that has symptoms, we need to find out whether they have signs. Uh, in terms of our history and symptoms, then triaging questions, we need to recognize, of course, it is not just eye care practitioners that look at dry eye patients. Uh, it is GPs and my brother's a pharmacist, for example. Um, so these are the sorts of questions we would ask anyway to make sure that it really is dry eye. It isn't something else uh, like an infection or allergy. And likewise, to identify conditions like Sjogren's syndrome, which, of course, is dry eye but we need to make sure that any comorbidities are uh, dealt with with that particular uh, condition. On top of our triaging questions, then, we also in our history and symptoms are going to look at the environment that the patient is in. This is where we're going to learn about medications, contact lens wear, other things that aren't going to contribute to diagnosis, but are going to allow us um, to better manage that patient when we move forward. When it comes to the diagnosis, we've got our screening questionnaires. They identify two key questionnaires, either the ocular surface disease index with its 12 questions, all about the frequency of dry eye and environment, or the dry eye questionnaire with its five questions, uh, sorry, yeah, five questions on discomfort um, <clears throat> of the uh, ocular surface, both frequency and severity, and then a question on uh, watering of eyes. So if either of those meet the cutoff, then we can move forward to our homeostasis markers. And this is where uh, the Medmont comes into its own, the Meridia, with non-invasive breakup time, much better than a fluorescein breakup time, because we're not disrupting that very fragile tear film. Anything less than 10 seconds would be diagnostic of dry eye, and the Meridia does that objectively for you rather than having to watch the image and have a subjective timing. Osmolarity is a second measure we can do. Obviously, that's not something that the Meridia can do. 
um, but is something that some people add in practice. Um, and then surface staining and, and the Meridia is a fantastic imaging device. It's the only device I've ever had when, when I show patients um, the screen, they go wow, because it is really impressive in terms of the imaging quality as I'll show you uh, in a moment later on. So any one of those homeostasis markers plus symptoms, so it could be a short non-invasive breakup time plus symptoms or ocular surface staining plus symptoms or a combination would be a diagnosis of dry eye. But of course, we can't stop there. We need to move forward and to subtype the dry eye because that will help us then in our management. So how can the Meridia help us with this? So incorporating TFOS juice too into our clinical practice, but with the assistance of the Meridia. Well, of course, when it comes to symptomology, that's very simple. It's just a questionnaire. These two are freely uh, available to people, but there are also apps now. You can see uh, one that's available on the App Store, another that we've devised where you can go through things like the uh, DQ5, um, the OSDI, uh, and also the Sandor, which are two visual analog scales for dry eye frequency and severity. But also while it's doing that, it can monitor your blinking, for example, so it can tell us about your blink rate and completeness. So these are, um, is that first screening step. But where the Meridia gets involved is when we move on to that diagnostic testing. So here we want our non-invasive breakup time and our ocular surface staining. So as you've seen already, of course, it can do our non-invasive breakup time and it will automatically then give us values that it is objectively measured in terms of when that first breakup uh, occurs. When we put fluorescein into the eye, and of course, it's very important that we put a minimal amount uh, into the eye because um, we are trying to make sure that we don't disrupt the tear film too much, although we're not looking at stability at this stage, this comes later you can see it's really good at picking out not only staining, but also the breaks uh, in that tear film. So really high resolution imaging, and it works fantastically well with its optimized blue light around that 495 nanometers, not the traditional cobalt light, which a lot of the old slit lamps used, which have been shown by research to not be optimal um, and actually to be slightly hazardous um, to the eye. So blue light, built-in yellow filter, so you really don't need to worry. You put it on this setting and automatically uh, then we have this nice uh, type image. Moving forward from then, we're going to put our lysamine green in. This is different. We're going to put a whole drop of saline on our um, paper strip with lysamine green, and we're going to roll the whole of that drop into the eye. And that's really good because that will then dye the surface. We're going to wait a little bit longer for that to happen. And we can then clearly see damage to the ocular surface. And um, so this is actually my eye. So you can see I have quite marked uh, dry eye. You can see uh, significant staining. So I would certainly meet uh, the Jews 2 criteria. But also we can look at aspects such as the lid margin. So you can see Mark's line here, but actually you can see that there's friction between my eyelid and the ocular surface, which means that we're getting this, what they call lid wiper epitheliopathy, damage to the cells along this margin. And when we come to remove keratinization, this is also very useful to see where we're going to remove that keratinization from. So really important uh, instrument for making that diagnosis. It gives us that non-invasive breakup time. It gives us that imaging of the ocular surface, not just the cornea, but also the conjunctiva to allow us to see whether someone meets that criteria for the diagnosis. So now we've got a diagnosis, we can move on to the subclassification. And the subclassification has stayed the same. So evaporative or aqueous dry eye, we know that the majority of patients fall into that evaporative uh, category where we're principally looking at the lids, but there are some patients that are more aqueous and it is a spectrum. So we have patients in between. So let's look at aqueous deficiency. First of all, this is the easier measure to uh, do. And TFOS Juice 2 recommended that we should be using non-invasive testing. 
So we're not going to put a Sherma strip or phenyl red. We've all had patients where you put a Sherma strip in, it sticks to their cells, the eye is so dry, but of course it then stimulates reflex tearing, which can confuse your measurement. So we can see really easily the tear uh, meniscus height. And one of the advantages of the midridia is it allows us to do that in infrared light. So we can do that without disrupting the tear film, changing blink rate, those sorts of aspects. And then there are calipers where we can measure that multiple times to get ourselves an accurate reading. So really easy to understand whether this is an aqueous form of the disease. What about when it comes to the evaporative uh, form of the disease? We're wanting to look at the lid margins. Again, fantastic imaging with the meridia to allow us to do that. And we can look at things like the expressibility of the glands, how many express, and the quality of that expression. Marbography, and I'll show you some imaging from that in the next slide. Interferometry, not a present feature of the Medmont, but I'll show you how well it can do that with future innovations blink and lid closure, and then that lid margin characterization that I talked about in the previous slide. So the Meridia can do um, um, myobography very well. One thing we often don't talk about is actually how easy it is for the clinician to do this. Many of the instruments have big bowls, and that makes it really difficult to lid avert around them or very small working distances. Meridia is a dream for this, much further working distance and a very small cone, so it's very easy to access uh, the eyelids and to successfully uh, invert those really clearly. So you can see here the uh, lower glands, uh, my eye again, fairly good for lower glands, but when it comes to the upper glands, um, it's definitely um, some loss there. And what the new system has, and I haven't shown it in here, is enhancement software, which will draw out those glands even more clearly uh, in terms of allowing you to visualize those. So we talked about the gland imaging, but what about things like the expressibility? Well, one of the really nice features of the Meridia is it can take um, some fantastic videos. So let's see some expression. So here I'm using the uh, Corb expressor. So this puts the pressure onto the eyelid equivalent to a normal blink. We put it just below uh, the lid margins there and we're looking at the expression of the glands. You can start to see a little bit of expression. My eye doesn't express particularly well, but it gives us really good imaging of that. Again, very powerful with our patients that they can see exactly uh, what the tests were. Of course, at this point, they're, they're staring up and something strange is pressing the eye so they can understand the testing better and why then we're recommending a particular type of management. So really powerful. Uh, we're doing a little bit more than we would do normally here. So we would normally do um, three presses, uh, central, nasal and temporal to see how the glands are expressed with that. So really powerful, that sort of imaging technology that allows us to see that. It's probably not streaming perfectly for you because these are really high quality uh, videos. Um, so obviously they'll look much better on the Meridia screen than they will do in terms of the video capacity. And we're working my laptop um, very hard this evening. Okay, so as well as doing uh, our diagnostic expression, we can do therapeutic uh, expression. So let's see whether we can move on to that. So here we're now using a pair of uh, forceps, uh, specially designed to allow us to get to the bottom of the glands to move uh, the um, marbum up and hopefully to uh, express, uh, um, allowing patients to have a more effective treatment when we're doing the warming of their eyelids. Uh, and again, I'm not sure how clearly the video is coming through to you, but this is uh, excellent quality uh, video, certainly on my screen. And you can see the marbum uh, coming through uh, in terms of the oils and onto the ocular surface. So again, as I said before, really powerful communication tool uh, with our patients, but also then really important for us in terms of saying, yes, this is an evaporative form of the disease. And likewise, that things like warm compresses or in-office treatments with intense light -like therapy, intrinsic light, some of the new ILUX technology, uh, um, lippy flow, 
would benefit this patient because of the uh, state of their glands. So this is a really important step between diagnosis, where we need to use our standardized tests, and then when it comes to subclassification or trying to determine which treatment is going to work best for a patient, where we have a wider range of tests that we're going to do to identify um, that particular um, output and condition. Now, I mentioned about interferometry. This is something that Medmont are working on to add to their instrument. And hopefully this will give you an insight to the type of, um, so this is actually taken with the Meridia. So what we've done is put an insert into the front uh, of it that we're working on. And you can see that you can very clearly see the oils there. I've given you the large picture. Obviously, we can zoom in on the eye um, and it's in isolation. What's really nice about this is we're not just looking at a small inferior area to get that uh, imaging. Actually, we can see the, um, the uh, oils over the whole surface or certainly the, the central seven millimeters um, of the eye in terms of the um, pattern that we're getting there. So again, really impressive type technology with the imaging. Likewise, there are lots of controls where you can change the image in terms of light saturation, which light you use, uh, the magnification that you choose to uh, image over. Um, and because it's a very high digital resolution image, it means that you can take a central area out of it and still get exceptionally high uh, imaging capability from that. So I'd like to propose that uh, this is a really powerful instrument. Certainly, it's made a big difference to our clinic uh, in terms of our communication with patients, but also in terms of our ability to very accurately diagnose based on that TIFOS Juice 2 consensus worldwide criteria, but also then to do that subtyping to inform uh, the management of the disease. So I would highly recommend this machine to you. Um, it's been a, a real game changer for us in terms of our uh, dry eye clinic, uh, which is something that uh, attracts people from certainly all over uh, the UK because uh, dry eye is extremely prevalent. Um, the studies suggest anywhere between 5 and 50%, and certainly in uh, UK studies that we finished uh, recently, uh, the rate was around 35 to 40% in a general population that matched the general population. So really high in terms of the number of people who are suffering from this disease. And it's not just our older population. We have a lot of younger patients. Uh, and again, our research and, and others have shown a direct correlation between the amount of screen time, which of course has gone up um, with COVID and um, myobomium gland uh, dysfunction, so damage to the glands when we image them in myobography. Again, a really powerful communication tool uh, with our patients. So we're likely in future to get even more working age or school age children who are suffering from dry eye disease um, that we will need to manage in our clinics. So at this point, I shall uh, hand back to John. Um, I'm very happy to answer any questions um, and likewise John can give um, information from the Medmont side uh, as well and I hope that's been useful to you um, to introduce you to this new technology. John. Thank you uh, Professor Wilson. Um, we do have a few questions um, and uh, this one's from uh, Deborah. Uh, she says she's having some difficulty with the non-invasive breakup time. It, she finds it takes too long to start the video, which affects the results. And she's wondering if you have any uh, tricks to suggest. But before you answer that, uh, I'm not sure which uh, instrument Deborah is working on and what software version, but we did just put some new enhancements uh, into the software that will allow uh, for a quicker startup time on that non-invasive breakup time. But if you have any uh, tricks or suggestions on uh, how, how to do it better, well and good listen. Sure. So um, again, we've had some issues initially in terms of just the, the time to get things started and, and lined up. So the instrument recognizes that it's time for that uh, double blink. Um, but with the newer software that has uh, improved and I know Medmont are, are committed to uh, improving their software where they get clinician um, feedback. So hopefully that will be better for you in future iterations uh, of the software um, with that current hardware that you have already. Yeah, great. 
Um, so we have another question, um, and it is the um, Menmont Meridia have any grading software for mybobian gland loss? So it certainly has the ability now, and, and this is a, quite a new function to put up a, a grading scale against your image. So you can do a, a direct grading. Obviously, that's still a subjective grading. Uh, and I know that we're working with the team um, to see whether we can get more objective uh, grading from the instrument as well. Uh, there are not many instruments that, that do that and certainly not that do that well. Um, so that is the, the next step in terms of software development. Right, yeah, we, we do have some grading uh, for all your dry eye applications and in terms of um, choices there. But we also have a, a report and I'm just wondering, uh, have you been able to work on the uh, report at all, Dr. Wolfson? Yeah, yeah so unfortunately, um, uh, again, it's something that I work with Medmont on, making sure that that report was really helpful. Um, it's very good for our patients, but also then for informing GPs, for example. So these newer features of the software, like the, the grading, which, as John said, you can do now for your redness and, and other features as well uh, as myobography, and that report feature is really powerful. Yeah, thank you. Um, and so uh, another question that came in, do you consider the TFSQ, you know, analysis standard of care for the tear breakup time today? So. Um, that's a difficult one because there have not been too many direct measures about the different ways that companies have approached this. And likewise, it's going to depend a little bit on um, the instrument and, and the projection that it forms. So obviously with the Meridia, you've got many more uh, rings there than the many instruments, so you can take more fine measurement. And so they've de developed an algorithm that works well with their particular imaging. Um, so um, to me, um, is it a gold standard? Well, it seems to work well, uh, and it is an objective measure. So to me, that's what I'm looking for in terms of helping me as the clinician to know whether it falls into that category of unstable or apparently stable. Great. Thank you for that, Professor Wilson. Um, I believe that is all the questions that we have today. So thank you. Um, I just want to remind the audience that we have uh, our, our number three in a series of three uh, on Tuesday, June 29th with a uh, expert panel of users of Medmont Meridia. And we will go into further details about topography, contact lens fitting, as well as dry eye applications of the Medmont Meridia on actual users that have been uh, uh, working with the Medmont Meridia for the past year. Um, so uh, if you would like to submit your questions in advance, please send me an email and I'll be glad to uh, include them uh, for the panel discussion on June 29th. So this completes our uh, part two of our three part series introducing Medmont Meridia. Again, please be on the lookout for an email for further information. Um, and I want to offer you a special thank you and a gratitude to Professor Wolfson for his efforts today. Uh, it's always wonderful to hear what you have to say. Additionally, to our wonderful audience, um, we at Medmont thank you for taking the precious time to learn more. If you have questions that may arise, please go to our website at medmont.com and request information. Again, thank you. Be safe. Good day and good night. So.